some yet thing with life. Not this end, but not. What do you mean? That thing hasn't changed. Well, I don't know what thing you're talking about. Were you, when you, were like, some... I'm telling you, we're like, can you start? Okay. <laughs> Hi, welcome. This is Terry Edwards from makingallplacements.com. I've been told that we're live, which is a. Uh, I'm just <laughs> muted because of that. According to the system this end, we're not quite live. But anyway, I'm going to keep going. You don't know what it looks like on our live. I don't know what you're looking for. I've literally never used this software before. Well, I still don't think we're live. But if we are live, I'll tell you what, let's put an end to this dispute. Just, just give me a wave or something or like this so I know that we're live. We just hope for a more, few more people to join us. So, Drew, have you got the technical side sorted out now? You're ready to go? Yeah. Um, yeah, we're going to be talking about four or five questions top recruiters ask to make more placements and earn more money. Uh, going to get started in about 30 seconds. That's what we're going to be talking about today. But, yeah, we're, most, we're definitely live. Okay. When you get these four key questions, you will make more placements. You will, will work less and you will earn more. That is a promise. <clears throat> Just for your information, <clears throat> some of your competitors are using these four key questions right now. And it's given them an edge over over you, but you're going to be able to regain that competitive edge. So we'll be kicking off real shortly. As soon as we go live on this, you'll, you'll get this information. <laughs> so the four vital questions that top recruiters ask to make more placements and earn more money. Coming to you live and direct on Facebook. Go. Okay. I've been on for a while now. Okay, <laughs> I'm going to show you four key questions. I, I know you're you're waiting there with bated breath. Listen, on a serious note, you know what it's like. You pick up the job order from the from the hiring manager. They've, uh, they've approved your terms, and you're kind of good to go. At this stage, inexperienced recruiters will hi get back to the office or to put the phone down and high five their their colleagues about just winning this job order. But here's a fact that we shared with you many times before. The average contingent recruiter will not fill most of the job orders that they get. In fact, the average recruit contingent recruiter will fill between 10 and maybe 40 percent of the job orders that they that they actually work on. Ultimately, what it does mean is that most of the time you're working, you're not going to get paid. Now, if you've got a team of consultants, you let's say you've got a team of four, you, you multiply that by four. That's the amount of time that you're wasting. And it's a real pain in pain in the butt, for want of a better word. Anything to add to that, Drew? Uh, no, not at this stage. Okay, okay. But what we know is there's four essential questions, or key questions, or four vital to ask a hiring manager. And if you ask these hiring managers these four key questions, um, you will make placements, you will earn more money, and you will work less hours. That, that's an absolute. So you've got the job order. <clears throat> This works whether it's on the phone or, or face to face. The next question that you, sorry, the first question that you should ask. Is okay, every, can you explain what you know? What the I guess, some implications if you don't ask these? You broke up there, Drew. I said just go into you know what are some of the implications if you don't ask. The... Oh, okay, yeah. So some of the implications if you don't ask these well, um Invariably, most of the time you're working, you're not going to get paid because most of the most of the contingent uh, job orders that you get, you don't fill. You're going to waste a lot of time, which ultimately means you're going to waste a lot of money. Um, it has a really negative impact, actually, if you don't ask. If you ask these questions, this will substantially improve staff morale. Because asking these questions, your guys will fill more roles. You'll fill more roles. So invariably, whenever our clients do it, one of the things they notice that there's a vast improvement and you earn more money. See, that's what we're here for, to as uh, much money as possible. Anything else you'd like to add to that, Drew? Yeah, I think, um, you know, at the end of the day, if you're not asking these questions or similar, um, you're working with non-committed clients. So you to recruit all the time who, um, you know, they win, they win job orders with, with clients and, you know, sending candidates through, but they're just not getting feedback maybe cancel the job order they don't hear back you know a massive commitment from the the client side so this helps you you know change all of that so you know when you when you when you get this right when you start putting questions into your sales process um you know the clients that you've been you know you the outcome your business 
uh, your cash flow, obviously, you know, as, as we said already, higher fill rate orders that you work on. Um, also, I think a big thing, you'd be able to block your competitors as well. So if you're, you know, at the moment, a recruiter where your, you know, job orders that you win, you're competing with two other, you know, agencies or, or, or recruitment businesses to try and fill the same role, also eliminates all of that as well. So many advantages to uh, these questions. <clears throat> is every single time you get a job order, ask for it on a retained basis, every single time. Make it compulsory in your business for every single time. It always makes me smile when recruitment search firm and firm owners say, well, in our market, our clients don't pay retainers. And the question that I always ask is, well, how often do you ask for it? And they say, well, we don't ask for it because we, we, you know, our clients don't pay. Well, I've got, I've got news for you. If you never ask for a retainer, you will never ever get a retainer. For those that don't know, a retainer is where the client will pay you a percentage up of the fee up front before you even start work. And it's just worth asking the question. In my humble opinion, the amount of the retainer that the client pays is almost irrelevant at one level. The retainer isn't about the money. The retainer is about the commitment. So you ask for a percentage of the fee up front. I used to work with a client um, in the eastern part of the, of the UK. I think their retainer was something like £299, uh, about $400, quite frankly, nothing, you know, absolutely nothing. But it's not about the money. It really is about the commitment. So the question number one is asking me, now this, I'm not, we, can't, we haven't got enough time to go into it now, but there is a specific way that you would ask for a retainer so that the client wants to Hey, Yuri, perhaps if you jump on the call, we can go into that detail. But there's a, there's a process that you go through so the client is, is ideally is, is receptive to paying the retainer. So that's question number one. Ask for a retainer. Anything to add to that one, Drew, before we go on? Yeah, I think, you know, it's, it's not just about the money when you, you know, when you ask for a retainer, it's about the commitment from, from the client. Um, but also, I think, you know, ignore the financial benefits of it. I think if you're... If you're going to get, you know, a, a, a fifty percent of the fee run before you've even started the work, you know, yes, you get the commitment from the client, but I think also um, it just helps with your cash flow because you know, um, you know, you know, you've got the money in on, on day, you've got the fee coming in, assuming that you deliver on uh, your promises as well. And um, so I think, yeah, you know, it, it's good just to get commitment from the client, but I think it's, you know, best not best not ignore the benefits to you on your cash flow. Um, so rather than working on, you know, lots of job orders, maybe not even you know that you've got that many coming in already. Yeah, good, good point. So look, full confession here: you're going to ask for a, you're going to ask for a retainer. Full confession: not all of the prospects that you ask for a retainer will agree to paying you a retainer, but that's okay. Nothing works a hundred percent, by the way. Absolutely nothing. But the second question to ask, if they refuse or decline investing and paying you a retainer, because something's gone on there. If, they, if you've asked for the retainer, um, what psychologists found is that to say no to somebody, to reject somebody, creates an element of discomfort. If my manager says no to you, what we're going to encourage you to do is to take it. The hiring manager's going through that very So that if they check them in the look, do you still want to go ahead? Do you still want to find the top candidates? Yes, we certainly do, but our company policy, we don't pay retainers or whatever it is, whatever it is that they say. Question number two, ask for the assignment exclusives. And say lines of, lines of, hear what you're saying, but look, in view of what you just said, can we have this assignment on an exclusive basis for 20 working days, 30 working days, 20 working days, by the way, 30 working days is, is six weeks, but Ask for a time that you can have this assignment on an, on an, on an exclusive basis. As Drew pointed out earlier, with the, of contingent recruiters, one of the reasons you're not filling most of the roles is that you're competing against four or five other recruiters. You've now blocked all your competitors for the next month, six weeks, on this particular assignment, simply by asking the question. And if they're going to pay or re re decline, refuse to pay you, on, on the engagement fee, there's a, the, the, they're more likely to pay you on it in exclusive because of the discomfort that you've created within them. You get on the retainer, you've got your competitors. 
get it on the exclusive, you block to your competitors, which is one of the big problems that business owners have on contingencies that are competing with, with, with everybody else on that particular assignment. Thoughts on that, Drew? Yeah, uh, again, obviously agree with your points. I think for, for me, now obviously if you get the retainer in the first instance, you, you don't ask for the exclusive. Um, but for me, it's, it, it, it's not, you know, you haven't really won anything. You haven't really won a job order. It's not worth celebrating winning the job order if it's not on retained or, or, or an exclusive. Um, the, you know, there's so many recruiters in the market who are celebrating winning the job order. But then when you sort of, you know, look at it a bit deeper, they, they haven't won it. They're competing with role and they're perhaps even late to the party as well so they've, they've got very slim chance of actually filling the role. Um, so I think you know if we if we can all make the shift from you know not let's not just accept any job order that's as an industry only work on retained or if we can't get retained only work on exclusive I think it would improve um, the industry as a whole but you know for your individual business it'll improve the results you get in your business. Absolutely absolutely yeah and as I said when, when about our clients have done that uh, if you've got a team or you, you enjoy working on roles now where you're working exclusively or, or you're working retained. Question number three, ask the hiring manager when you pick up the job order for the uh, will be conducting the interviews. We've all been there, you know, former recruiter, we've all been there. We used to, we used to call it when you meet the, the candidate on steroids, you know, the candidate that you've met them, you think this is a this is a cert deal. This candidate will definitely get the role. And you're talking to the candidate, and the candidate's perfect for the role. And you say, "Leave it with me. I'm going to get back to you. I'm going to speak to the hiring manager. I'm going to get a date and diary and get you interviewed as quickly as possible." You then get onto the phone and you call the hiring managers in the meeting. The hiring manager calls back maybe two later. You're on another call contact with the hiring manager yourself just to get a date for the meeting. In time. The candidate on steroids then calls you back saying, any news, any dates for the interview? I'm sorry, I'm still trying to get a date now. And all this time, uh, the enthusiasm that, that the candidate has now is, is, is being, being worn away because everything's up, up, up in the air. You can eliminate a similar hiring manager there and then for the dates that they do it. And get those done, you know, um, in your diary. Now, when you meet that <clears throat> that candidate on steroids, as we used to call them, you can now say to the candidate there and there, "Hey, listen, you tick all the boxes. These are the dates that the hiring manager will be interviewing. Which of these dates suits you best?" It's done. Here's also what's interesting on this: if the hiring manager says, "Well, actually, due to circumstances, I'm not interviewing. I, we can't interview for another six weeks from now." Well, at least you know. See, one of the problems that many recruiters make is they, they, they work their butt off, quite frankly, they get all the candidates, they go back to the hiring manager, the hiring manager says, it, we're getting, but we're really busy at the moment to get these calendars lined up with all, all the other hiring managers. It would probably take us to the... Well, the hiring manager will say two or three weeks. In fact, four, six weeks. All have been avoided for the time of you picking up the job order. So some hiring managers will say, Hell, I'm going to interview next week. I'm going to interview next week. At least you know. Borders, you should be giving a manager that's going to, sorry, interview in the next 10 days or so are the ones that um, are going to get priority in terms of your, your, your workload. Anything to add to that? No, no. Awesome. And the final uh, question there is, can we agree that, that you will give me feedback? Sorry about this. Can you give the dates that you'll give me feedback on the candidates that you're going to be interviewing? So not only do you get the dates that you're going to be interviewing, dates that you're on the, on the, on the actual interviews. Again, experienced recruiter, you, you know, um, candidate goes in, candidate comes back to you saying, fantastic interview, I really clicked, this job really appeals to me, and you say, oh, I'll get back to you, you and or you can never get back you can never uh, get the feedback but look if you take responsibility for that and say look to avoid that such as the hiring manager to make effective use of your time make sure that you don't miss out on the top candidates can we agree the date now that you'll give me fits out in any way whatsoever 
So if a client's going to interview, let's say, on the on the 10th of the month, you're going to agree to them, say, on the 12th of the month at a specific time. And let's say you're on the phone doing this. You say, great, let me send you a calendar in right now. Uh, the feedback telephone meeting will take 20 minutes. Let's speak at 10 o'clock on the 12th of uh, whenever, and I'll send you a calendar in right. But notice what you've done there. You've taken control. All too often, contingent, re contingent recruiters have absolutely no control of what's what's going on within within the meeting. I'm sorry, within the hiring hiring assignment pr process, no control whatsoever. And in terms of budgeting and forecasting for the future, now you've got the dates when you know uh, you're going to get feedback from the hiring manager. In terms of your forecasting as well. These questions, as Drew points out, right at the very block your competitors, massively improve your cash flow, substantially uh, improve your uh, staff morale. Um, now you're working on, reta on a, re on a re retained or exclusive basis. You're not Here's the thing if a client refuses to answer the, uh, three of those questions, you can walk away. If a the client won't give you the date that they're going to give you, the date of the feedback. What that's telling you is they're not so committed to this process. Well, why would you even want an assignment or a job order if the client isn't committed to the process? Does that make sense, Drew? Yeah, it makes perfect. I think things that I think I want to make clear is that there's there's, a, there's good there's good job orders and there's bad orders. And I think if you haven't got you know answers to at least three of these, or um, you know. Well, answer, you know, answers to each of them, right? It's not a good quality job order. And if it's not a good quality job order, then you shouldn't be working on it. I think if you can sort of get that clear in your business and only, you know, dedicate your time, energy, and attention to the high quality job orders or the retained job orders, um, then you'll be a lot better off. Yeah, absolutely. If you're if you're managing a team, that's you should make that part of your criteria. So when they when they come to you, report to you, you know, your team, they say we've just won this job order. You should ensure that they ask those four questions. As Drew said, if you haven't got three, at least three of them answered, answered positively, certainly two, you know, uh, data of the interview and data of the feedback, you should be saying to your team, there's no point working on this. You need to spend your time on clients uh, and assignments and job orders where there's, there's uh, respect on both parties and, and they're committed to the process as well. Now, it kind of goes without saying, I think that's critical to all this. This is only going to work when you're talking to the hiring managers. That are hiring in the future. So if you're one of those recruiters and you simply ambulance chase adverts and so on, well, that's, it's not going to work. And and quite frankly, you should be doing that. You should be talking to hiring managers and engaging the recruiters in the next 30 to 60 days, not hiring manager that's already using half a dozen recruiters. Because clearly if they are, it's a real challenge then to get this on a retained basis or exclusive. It's not impossible, by the way, but it's a lot more challenging. One of the things we would share with you is that you have a what we call a, a deal flow. So you've got more leads than you can than you can actually uh, manage. So um, you're always ahead of the game. You're always talking to hiring managers that can be hiring in the future rather than the hiring managers that are hiring now. Anything to add to that, Drew? No, I think you covered it well. Again, if you um if you want to if you're a recruitment business owner, more placements uh, for higher fees and you want to do it in a way that doesn't suck time and energy away from you as a business owner, uh, if you could head over to makemoreplacements.com forward slash apply, the short letter there that explains how we might be able to help. So that's make, www.makemoreplacements.com forward slash apply. Yeah, and just to add to that, if you want to be talking to hiring managers that are hiring in the future, if you want to get more information on how you can make more placements, how you can increase your personal earnings and have the business that you desire, just jump on the call. There's no obligation, uh, there's no cost. Uh, just simply jump on the call. And we'll have a chance if there's anything that we can do for you. So that's makemoreplacements.com forward slash apply. And there's a letter there that tells you all about it. Drew, thank you very much indeed. Always good to, to have you on the calls and uh, and handling the technical side. Because uh, <laughs> clearly you know what you're doing. <laughs> and uh, listen, th thanks for joining us, everybody. Until next time, take care, take action and be relentless. Cheers, folks.